Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Sahil. And I have a very good case on Hashimoto's and Kaplopathy, you know. And uh, uh, a small presentation following it. Uh, this topic is very interesting because it's so understudied and underdiagnosed that I thought it'll be a very good topic presentation. So, so we had a 25 year old uh, previously healthy female uh, with no medical or surgical problems or any family history of any neurological disease. So she presented to the clinic with gradually progressive dizziness, imbalance, right-handed tremor, clumsiness, and she had some difficulty walking. So her symptoms were so progressive that she ultimately required a wheelchair uh, and her speech became slurred and her tremor became um, so worse that she could not eat or do like combing of her hair and other uh, daily living activities. On the exam, we found that uh, vertical up, upward gaze ha had an nystagmus and her conjugate eye movements were impaired. She also presented with generalized hypotonia. Uh, she had a severe partial intentional tremor uh, with dysmetria and dysdiadecokinesia. Uh, she also had a broad based and tremulous gait when we asked her to walk. Uh, she was unable to perform the tandem gait and all her sensory modalities were normal. So this gave us a broad picture and um, directed us towards cerebellar cause because all these signs are usually found in cerebellar uh, diseases. Uh, on the diagnosis, we run a, a full panel of uh, connective tissue screen, uh, celiac disease autoantibodies, thyroid function tests, and every, everything came to be normal. We also ran some genetic diseases uh, panel like for Wilson's, uh, hereditary ataxias and other immune mediated ataxias, but everything was negative. The only solid positive finding she had was her anti TTP antibodies and anti TG antibodies were highly elevated. And we also did a, a CSF uh, tap, and that was also unremarkable. So on her MRI, uh, we saw that she had a bilateral. Um, cerebellar atrophy. As you can see, the cerebellar is very atrophied. Uh, there's prominence of fourth ventricle. And when you see the other section, you can see the cerebellar pontine angles. Uh, they have been widened, which also indicates uh, cerebellar atrophy. So she had cerebral atrophy, prominence of fourth ventricle, but other brain structures were normal. On EEG, they were very uh, unspecified findings like focal slaying over right side. So ultimately after all the exclusion and presence of thyroid antibodies, it pointed us towards a diagnosis of Hashimoto's and Kaplopit. So now we start our main topic, that's Hashimoto's and Kaplopathy. This is Mr. Hashimoto. He's the brain behind Hashimoto thyroiditis. He was a scientist from Kyoto, uh, a great scientist. And he was, a scientist in 1800s and even today after 200 years of, uh, after his period, we still don't know a lot about Hashimoto's encephalopathy. So Hashimoto's encephalopathy is also called stereoresponsive encephalopathy. This is because most of the patients, around 80 to 85 per, uh, percent patients are steroid responsive. So over a few months after being on steroids, they usually, they're all symptoms reverse and most of their MRI findings also get reversed. So there are many patterns that we have encountered um, after looking it through literature. A lot of other doctors and a lot of their other patients, they have come to a conclusion that there's so many patterns for this encephalopathy, but usually it presents in two patterns, which I'm gonna to describe today. So the first pattern could be like a stroke-like uh, pattern which with a lot of focal neurological deficits. Uh, which can also have um, loss of consciousness or alteration of consciousness. The other pattern we usually see uh, is more slow, more progressive, uh, which includes dementia, confusion, hallucination, and some other psychiatric um, symptoms also. But this is not absolute. These both patterns can overlap. Other patterns can come and join these. So, you cannot describe one pattern for one patient. Some cases, but rare cases, can also rapidly deteriorate to coma, 
The other uh, neurological signs that we see in uh, patients with Hashimoto's encephalopathy are focalized or generalized seizures. So around half of the patient will have generalized seizures and many of them will have myoclonus. So just like any other autoimmune disease, uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy can be self-limited, relapsing, remitting, or progressive. One very important thing to point out is that we call it encephalopathy and not encephalitis because in the brain there is no inflammation. So what is the pathophysiology behind? The topic being understudied and underdiagnosed, there are many uh, theories that have been floating around in scientific community, whether these are the two main theories that have been proposed with evidence. So first theory is the autoimmune theory. So what usually happens is uh, some scientists propose that uh, immune complexes deposit in the brain, which disrupts the microvasculature, ultimately causing the autoimmune vasculitis. Now the evidence to support this is that when some of the patients within Hashimoto's encephalopathy died and on retrospective, when an autopsy was done or a biopsy was, brain biopsy was done, we could see lymphocytic infiltration around arterioles and venules. The other main important evidence uh, supporting this theory is that most of the patients on, on this type of encephalopathy are steroid responsive, which happens with most of other autoimmune diseases. The women make the major share of the incidence, which is also true for other autoimmune diseases. There are high, there are elevated levels of anti-thyroid antibodies, whether it is anti-TPO or anti-TG, um, which also directs us towards an autoimmune process. And almost four-fifths of the patient or 80% of the patients have HLA-B8 positive. The other theory, which is more rare, uh, says that there is, in, because in, in thyroid disorders, they, especially the hypothyroidism, there is usually increased thyroid troppin release hormone which causes a direct toxic effect on the CNS neurons, especially the cerebellum. And the evidence to support this theory is that even though the patient was euthyroid, when you give thyroid supplementation, it suppresses the thyroid troppin release hormone and we can reverse the effects and vice versa. When we stop thyroid supplementation, the patient can get worse. But this is a very, uh, this happens in very less uh, percentage of the patients. So what are the general lab features of this disease? So the most important lab feature of this disease is the antithyroid antibodies. So it could be anti-TP or anti-TG, but the most important point about this is that there is no clear relationship between these antibodies and the severity of Hashimoto's encephalopathy. Because we have found that people with lower uh, concentration of these antibodies can have the uh, severe disease, as well as some patients with a higher concentration of these antibodies can have a milder disease. So we have not been able to establish a clear role, but the most important thing is that we find rise in anti-TPO or anti-TG or both in most of the of these patients. When testing thyroid function, it usually varies from patient to patient in all the reported uh, Hashimoto encephalopathy patients. Around one fourth of the patients have subclinical hypothyroidism. Around 24, 25 patients, another one fourth of the patients have overt hypothyroidism. A smaller fraction, 7% have hyperthyroid. And the maximum patient we encounter are euthyroid. The CFF, CSF analysis is approximate uh, is abnormal in approximately 80% of the patients, but it is not specific. In some patients, we found, found lymphocytic pleocytosis, which occurs in around 10 to 25% patients. The glucose concentration has always been normal. Sometimes we find oligoclonal bands, which are also very important in MS, but it's not very specific to the disease. In some patients, during, the, during my review of the literature, many scientists found 1433 protein, which is a very important component of Grootsfeld Jacob disease or the prion, prion disease, but this is also not a universal finding for HE. 
on the neuroimaging, uh, the most common thing that we found is cerebral or cerebellar atrophy and diffuse focal white matter changes, um, suggesting primary demyelination. Another strong argument was the autoimmune theory. So as you can see, there is uh, in right and left mesial areas, you can see hyperintensities. These are T2 and flare images. And this is a gadolinium enhanced, and you can see a mesial on both sides, on right as well as left mesial hyperintensities. Now here you can see there's been an hyperintensity in the precentral gyrus uh, of the mot uh, motor cortex. And on gadolinium, uh, gadolinium enhancement, we can see these pile enhancements. And these are very uh, unspecific, not very specific for uh, Hashimoto's. On EEGs, uh, the usual pattern we see is focal or generalized slowing down uh, of the brain activity. Now we come to differential. Now, because so many other diseases are more common and more studied, we often confuse uh, them with Hashimoto's or consider them before Hashimoto's. Uh, these are like uh, toxic metabolic encephalopathies, meningoencephalitis, psychiatric disease like depression, anxiety, psychosis, because they all can have over overlapping features with Hashimoto's and encephalitis. And especially when thyroid function tests are normal in most of the patients. So that's why it's very underdiagnosed. Uh, people with paraneoplastic autoimmune encephalitis can present with a similar picture. And the most common um, disease that, that people confuse Hashimoto encephalopathy with, uh, with, with Hashimoto encephalopathy is stroke. So how do we diagnose this underdiagnosed than so-called uh, understudied uh, disease? So it is this uh, diagnosis of exclusion plus these four uh, supporting uh, evidences. So the presence of thyroid antibodies, it doesn't matter the concentration of, but presence of thyroid antibodies, a compatible clinical presentation, and the most important, good response to glucocorticoids. No response to glucocorticoids does not rule out uh, Hashimoto's, but a good response to glucocorticoids is very sensitive for Hashimoto's and Kaplan's. The initial treatment that is recommended for these patients is glucocorticoids and treatment of the dysthyroid state. Even though patient is euthyroid, we prefer to supplement them with levothyroxine to suppress thyrotropin release hormone. So the duration, duration of the treatment is all individualized. It all depends on uh, the response we get from the individual patient. In patients with refractory Hashimoto's encephalopathy and steroid failure, there have been trials of IVIG and plasmapheresis with good response. Uh, since most of, the, most of these patients present with seizures, anti-seizure medication may be necessary. It may be temporary, but it may be necessary, especially uh, liracetam or Keppra, because it, apart from being an anti-seizure medication, it, is, it has also anti-inflammatory effects on the brain. So these are a few take-home points that I want everyone to uh, not forget after leaving this uh, presentation. But it's, it's, it's very rare and it's, uh, more, um, it affects more women than men. The bulk of the evidence um, that we see in the literature that uh, Hashimoto's encephalopathy is an autoimmune disorder and not a thyroid disease. So it has a lot of patterns, a lot of heterogeneous presentation. It could be fulminant, subacute, stroke-like, or more progressive or psychiatric-like. So the presence of elevated antithyroid antibodies usually support the diagnosis of uh, Hashimoto's, but there is no enough evidence to support the levels uh, of antithyroid antibody versus the severity of this disease. MRI findings, EEG findings, and CSF findings are usually very unspecific, but they are often recommended um, 
for the diagnosis of this disease. So in a patient uh, with undiagnosed encephalopathy, it's always a good idea as a third or fourth uh, line of um, diagnosis to, treat, uh, to test for antithyroid antibodies. And relapses are very common. So we have to keep altering with the uh, immunosuppressive therapy. So <laughs> this was just a, just a gig that as all young neuro neurologists, young doctors don't ever uh, waste your potential. All right, that's my time. And I hope uh, you have some questions for me. I'm ready.